Hi, and welcome back to Sisterhood in Surgery. Today's topic is redefining yourself mid-career as a vascular surgeon, the best approach to success. You all know my um, co-host, Dr. Palma Shaw, and today we have two wonderful guests who have been successful in all of their different um, positions, uh, Dr. Erica Mitchell and Dr. Jim McKenzie. Uh, remember, this is a live show, so you can uh, join by web, um, t uh, send your questions in to go to pollev.com, enter DeBakey, or you can um, text us at DeBakey to 37607 and text in your questions, and we'll get them answered um, live here on the show. Um, so I'll start off with introductions. Welcome, everybody. Um, so this is really... Uh, supposed to be fun, you can be honest, you can be funny or, or, or not. Um, so we'll start off with uh, Dr. Mitchell. She is a professor of surgery and interim division chief of vascular and endovascular surgery at the University of Tennessee Health Sciences Center in Memphis. And she holds a bachelor of science degree in geologic engineering from Colorado and a doctorate of medicine from the University of Colorado School of Medicine, as well as a master's of education from the Surgical Education Imperial College in London, United Kingdom, and is in the process of pursuing a Master of Healthcare Delivery Services from Dartmouth. Um, she completed her general surgery residency at the University of Colorado and was a Surgical Research Fellow in Melbourne, Australia. Um, she completed her fellowship in vascular surgery at Oregon Health and Science University at the same time doing a fellowship in interventional radiology. Um, during her career, she's held many administrative administrative responsibilities, including directing the surgery skills laboratory. I remember when I was a fellow, I she was at all the simulation training sessions, serving as associate medical director of surgical simulation and program director of the vascular surgery fellowship in Oregon for nine years. She served as vice chair for quality in the department of surgery at her prior institution, as well as the medical director for the Salem Health Hospitals and Clinics. Currently, she is the medical director um, in Memphis, and her areas of interest include vascular surgery outcomes, vascular surgical milestones, in particular postgraduate behavior and surgical outcomes, diversity, equity, and inclusion, social media and surgery, and outcomes for vascular trauma. She's widely published and has given numerous international, national, and local presentations. She's a sought-after uh, faculty for simulation and workshop uh, workshop training and is an active member in all vascular societies. She's received many honors and awards from SVS, such as the Women's Leadership Training Grant, the Presidential Citation Award, and is now a member of the Distinguished Fellow of the Society for Vascular Surgery. Welcome, Erica. Yes, welcome, Erica. So it's my pleasure to introduce our other guest, Dr. James McKenzie, so I'm so thrilled that he's uh, accepted our invitation to be the token male. Um, he's a board certified general and vascular surgeon and completed a vascular surgery fellowship at the University of Chicago, subsequently joining the faculty there. He became the chief of endovascular intervention and later vice chairman of surgery for education. In 2004, he relocated to New York Presbyterian Medical Center at Columbia University where he was site chief from 2004 through 2007 and subsequently chief of vascular surgery from 2007 through July of 2014. He was also the fellowship director of the New York Presbyterian Hospital Vascular Fellowship from 2007 through 2014. He is an endowed professor of vascular surgery and interventional radiology and presently vice chairman of Mount Sinai West, systems chief of complex aortic intervention and Surgical Director of the Jacobson Aortic Center for the Mount Sinai Systems Department of Surgery. Dr. McKenzie is active in medical education and chair of the ACS Committee on Medical Education. He has authored 157 abstracts and academic papers and 17 book chapters. He is nationally and internationally known for his work in the minimally invasive treatment of patients with critical limb ischemia and complex thoracic and abdominal aortic aneurysms and dissections. He's been active in new product development for the treatment of complex thoracobdominal, juxtarenal, and infrarenal abdominal pathology, including aneurysmal disease and dissections. He holds a patent for Nobel treatment of suprarenal aortic aneurysmal disease 
using a variable weave aortic endograft. Linda and I sincerely appreciate your both joining us today. You're both incredibly highly accomplished. You also have very unique experiences which have helped you get to where you are today. Often we felt that the focus has been on trainees and surgeons who are in their early years. And here we'd really like to focus on the greater challenge, which is really changing jobs or changing your uh, in mid-career, your, your path of focus. We welcome you and are looking forward to hearing about your reflections. Erica, I don't know if we can hear you. Are you, I think you're on mute. Yeah. Both of them were muted. You said we have to unmute. Um, I was muted. There, oh, okay. There, there we go. Okay. Um, so a couple points for discussion. What made you both to decide to change um, your career path and location? <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll go first. Well, my my career really has not been a straight pathway. I've made many a wrong turn or gone down the wrong road and had to do a U-turn or maybe sort of took a side road and then got back on the freeway. So certainly my career has been a little bit up and down, but I wouldn't have done it any other way. I think um, you know my career changes have been one from necessity or two from boredom, or three because I feel like I'm under I'm not achieving you know my maximal potential and therefore I'm not thriving and feeling like I could be doing something more worthwhile, and that sort of changed, inspired me to change or driven me to change really. I mean, at some point, if you're not happy, you either change it or you stay unhappy. <laughs> so, sort of in a nutshell, those are the fundamental issues. It, it, my changes have never been about salary. It's really been about career satisfaction um, and maybe changing for, you know, philosophy and goals. Yeah, Erica, I, I kind of agree with that. And, and we all get tunnel vision as we start in our career and think, okay, uh, here's my mentor and this is the path they took. So this has to be the right path. And, and we all try and follow that path. But, but like yourself, I kind of got into that path and then said, well, different things need to, to come about. And uh, starting in medical school, I had many different considerations going from uh, hemonc, OBGYN, interventional radiology, and then coming back to surgery. But I think that that kind of highlights, you've got to look at what's going on around you and don't just have preconceived notions. And then you make changes as you go along. Uh, so I came and thought I want to be a surgeon all through first, second year of medical school, so I was going to be a surgeon reconsidered things during my third year and then came back to surgery. Uh, and then I found vascular surgery um, as I was working with Tim Flynn at University of Florida and really said, that's where I want to go. Um, so I kind of tried different things, found what, a thing that fit best for me and then moved forward. Same thing with general surgery. I considered other things, but really knew I was going to go into vascular surgery. Um, going to the fellowship um, was a little bit more diverse because again, uh, we were kind of applying all over um, but uh, I'd just gotten married the year before. We had a small child who's only six months old. My wife's family were all there in Atlanta, and it was very comfortable to stay in Atlanta. But again, looking around and, and a very supportive spouse, um, we went up to University of Chicago, promising her we'd be there for a year, maybe two. And I do, I don't want to make any type of uh, statement here, but I will make one type of stereotypic statement men and husbands lie. Uh, and so when I told my wife would be there for a year to two, it turned into more like 12 uh, in Chicago, but we really enjoyed it. We found a couple opportunities that we looked at, but it wasn't the right move. And we stayed on the, the path that we were on. Um, did get to be in a uh, uh, movie with Harrison Ford, which is a nice little perk, kind of looking at different opportunities as you came through. Um, I apparently wasn't that good at it because they never called me back. Uh, but then I uh, went on and I kind of got stagnant, like you were talking about, doing the same thing. My mentor there had said, Jim, you're doing a great job. You need to accept this is where you're going to be. And I'm like, no, really don't want to do that. Um, I did take a, a path in the, with education uh, and really found that it was really invigorating to me. I got involved with the, the uh, sur uh, Educational Surgery Societies uh, and the Society for, excuse me, Society for Surgical Education, and then got involved with American College of Surgeons. This is where you have to be careful, though, because I was on the, the uh, 
a medical college and medical student committee. And I made a suggestion saying, this is wrong. We need to change the whole program. And they said, oh, really? How so? Well, next thing I know, I'm in charge of changing the whole program. And we drastically changed the, the, the medical student program for the Marin College Surgeons from going from just 20 to 25 senior students to being all encompassing now involving three, 400 students from medical students uh, all the way up, you know, one through four, uh, and even the people that are in pre-med to, to get them more involved in what it's like to be a surgeon. So you have to keep your eyes open and find an opportunity. With that though, like they said, I kind of capped out at, at, at uh, University of Chicago. And then at a, a, a program director's meeting, I read, ran into Craig Kent uh, and he was looking for a new chief at Columbia. And so uh, again, doing half my promise to my wife, we moved east, uh, not south, but to, to Manhattan. And they really recruited me to become uh, the carotid aneurysm guy uh, here at, at, at Columbia University in New York City, which was great. That's what I did. I had built a very big practice in that in Chicago and was kind of the go-to guy. Um, but then I ended up in, at uh, Columbia University, <clears throat> pardon me, and there was not a lot of carotid aneurysm disease there. Uh, I did some infraringual stuff, but most of my stuff was you know, abdominal and thoracic uh, type of work in carotid. I had to quickly kind of reinvent myself though and say, well, the business, if I'm going to, to prosper here, I told the surgeons that were there as part of my division, you go forward, do the work that we have here, uh, and I'm going to go out and find new business. And I just reinvented myself and became the critical and ischemia person about, and adopted new technology, went out and hit all the, the different, you know, podiatry sessions. We actually ran one of the first podiatric uh, educational courses in the country. Uh, back in 2004, we ran podiatric surgery, uh, critical limb ischemia for the podiatric surgeon. I thought I was going to get 10 to 15 people in for that program. And turned out we had 90. And we just kept building on building on that. And so I built the critical limb ischemia program up, recruit, recruited uh, Danielle Bajakian in, who took it over for me did a phenomenal job taking beyond where I ever had it. Uh, and I went back and I got my IDE and then got back in the aortic practice. Um, kind of hit the, you know, I was interim by campus chief for both Columbia and Cornell, then chief at Columbia, uh, and then went on and uh, uh, got an opportunity to really help with the aortic program throughout the Mount Sinai system. And it was time to make another move and we moved to Mount Sinai. Uh, and so I'm still here having a great time where, forgive my, my attire and everything, we're in the middle of finishing a Tambi operation right now. Uh, but uh, it, I love it. And just, you have to say every now and again, you have to reevaluate what's available to you, where are your desires, follow your heart and really say, I'm willing to make a change. Don't feel like you have to stay on the same path uh, that you started. on. So that's kind of a long winded uh, overview of how I got here, but it was really looking and then exploring every opportunity, seeing where I, I found something that was, I meant, me, was meaningful to me and then we let my career move in that direction. So. That's just great, uh, Jim and Erica. I just, um, I really admire both of you. I, I thank you so much for giving us all these pearls of wins wisdom. I, I love Jim's story. I've heard it before. <laughs> and I, I just wanted everyone else to hear it. It's great. Um, so I guess my other question is, um, were there any surprises? I mean, did, did you ever feel like I feel like sometimes, you know, I fall down and I have to get back up. I mean, I, like Erica, have a, you know, twisted, uh, interesting uh, career path. You know, it's uh, never traditional. Um, but uh, I usually just say, you know what, you've got to get back up. But I'd love to hear mm -hmm. some experiences that uh, you've had where you really, it took really an effort to get back up. I mean, I, I sometimes I felt like I failed and I had to find the strength and energy or the bravery to get back up. Maybe, Erica, do you want to reflect on that first? Yes, absolutely. I think, I mean, life is full of surprises. My mom used to say life is not easy. So I was sort of raised with that mantra that, you know, you just pick yourself up and keep going. And and I would say I have a, a, a cadre of very, very good friends, a, a good friend from childhood, a good friend from medical school, a good friend from engineering school. Um, and then, of course, my Vasco besties that, I have established, you know, a great strong friendship with them through surgical education. And it and I would say it's these friends that, you know, in the in the times when you're kind of doubting yourself, the, these are the friends that say, of course you're gonna do that. And of course we have your back. And of course 
you're going to make the change. And of course, you know, do it, you can do it. And so I think, you know, while there have been some dark days, I would say that I've always known there's light at the end of the tunnel. And, and I've always thought that, you know, if you're brave enough to make the change, the change may not come quickly, but in the end, you're much stronger and happier for it. I mean, I, I can't imagine not being where I am now. And I know that everything that I have done thus far has created the opportunities and the skill set and the tools and the experiences and the friendships to be where I am now. I mean, I have a tattoo that says Amor Fati and that essentially says, you know, I am who I am based on both the good and the bad that has been in my life. And I know I would not be Erica Mitchell if I hadn't had both the wonderful opportunities as well as some of the challenges that I've faced or, you know, brought upon myself because I've sort of fought the fight. Yeah, I, I have to say, you know, I, I'm probably the most senior person on the panel or oldest, if you want to put it that way, um, because I started my career uh, as a fellow in 1992. And there was no endovascular except for putting 22 French, you know, uh, Greenfield filters in. Uh, and we did that through an open uh, neck cut down. Um, and then I had people within my division that were very much saying endo is bad. You don't want to be doing it. Uh, but I, I really came in and saw this is the area we need to go. Uh, and so uh, kind of without letting people know about it, uh, they came through and said, you know, does anyone have a capital equipment request uh, that would like to put through? And I said, yeah, I want to put it through for a fixed room. And my chairman really wasn't didn't know about it, actually, which is kind of risky on my part to try and go something against the chair, who is also a vascular surgeon. Um, but we got it in and I put a business plan together. It was very, very educational for me. I started doing endovascular training programs in, the, in like 94, 95 for uh, vascular surgeons who were really not being encouraged or endorsed to, to go do uh, endovascular. Um, and then we finally actually got the approval from the hospital to build our first, we built the second in the country fixed room. Um, but, you know, I had the chair of radiology out to get me, cardiology out to get me, a lot of roadblocks that were put up. Um, but by doing the training, getting them involved, find, finding corporate leaders that were willing to help support us doing it, we actually got it through. Uh, and I kind of was able to do a little bit of end run with radiology because I made sure I included them as faculty in my endovascular training programs so that when they then tried to challenge me for getting a fixture, I said, well, obviously you, you will support us since you've been a faculty on our endovascular training courses. Um, but I remember the first paper I got on at the Society of Clinical Vascular Surgery about 94, 95, um, that was really looking at angioplasty for vein graft stenosis, not involving the proximal or distal anastomosis. And you thought I said, I'm against, you know, motherhood and everything else um, by that. And I was a, a heretic and everything else. Two, three years later, someone presented at SVS and was held, held, heralded as a landmark presentation. So a lot of times you have to take that chance. You have to get out there and try it. You say, I really think this is going to be what's right for patient care. And I think I've got an aptitude and an ability to do it. Um, and then you move forward. And yet sometimes you roll the dice, take a chance, sometimes you lose. But many times, if you're really willing to explore it and kind of find a different path, it'll work out great for you. And it certainly has for me. So I think to go to your, your question, Palma, yeah, I certainly had times when people tried to derail me again, you know, recruiting me uh, to Columbia for being the carotid aneurysm guy and just having mainly, you know, uh, AV access and CLI. Um, you had to reinvent yourself. And so you, you can... You can either bemoan what fate you're given or you make chicken salad out of something that's not. That's great advice. Um, so for, for people who are watching um, and who will watch later, when you start thinking about, okay, well, I need it. Well, one, I, I, I can certainly say it seems like you really know yourself very well, both of y'all, to know when you need a new challenge, when you feel bored. I mean, I would say that's one thing <clears throat> as, I don't, I don't know what I'm considered early career. I mean, I'm, I'm more than five years out, but I guess I'm still learning about what I find interest in, what, you know, just about myself. As a, as a surgeon and what I like and what I don't like and what I want to explore. Um, but where, how do you start? I mean, do you, I mean, you know, with all the political environment we're in, right? I mean, do you, you don't want to tell your current job, you know, okay, well, I want to leave, but then the vascular surgery world is very small. So how do you go about that without 
you know, making people mad or and getting what you want. In, in the end, it's your life. I mean, yeah. it's, it's your life, it's your job. And when you wake up in the morning, it's your day. It's your story, it's your movie. And you're in charge of your own destiny. I, I think, um, you know, I've certainly been surprised in the last couple of years when I've heard about people leaving this program, that program. But I, but I do think the last couple of years have been very telling in the sense of what is important to you in your life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know there was a period of time where I was going to work at, you know, six in the morning and coming home at nine o'clock at night. And I was there on Saturdays and I was there on Sundays. And, you know, I ended up, you know, I'm not saying I got cancer because of this, but I certainly ended up with cancer. And I think that was sort of an awakening for me to address what was important in my life again. And my friends all swear that that was the best thing that ever happened to me. And it probably was. And in that it, it made me recognize that while I love what I do, sometimes we, we can get a little bit tunnel visioned and, and we sort of lose the prize you know, for the destination instead of making it the journey. Mm -hmm. And I think I've, you know, sort of reassessed what's important to me. And, um, you know, and I, and I think intrinsically, you know, what makes you happy and what, what you're not happy doing. And at some point, and, and maybe it's maturity or maybe it's just at some point in your life, you just like, I'm going to do it no matter what people say. Um, and sometimes that does take you, you know, you have to be a little more than five years out of training. I think, you know, being 10 years out of training, it was, it was hard to sort of take away what I'd already accomplished. So, you know, I think if you're, you know, finding a new job every two years, that might not be a good idea. But if you establish yourself in something and then decide to do something completely off, off the wall, I don't think people will question, you know, why you're doing it mm -hmm. if they know you. Yeah, I, I have to agree with that. And I think if I if I said I wish I would have done something differently, I probably stayed in my first job too long. Um, and, you know, if you really kind of feel like, especially depends on what your goals are as you come through. Because some people, their goals are, I just want to do this. I want to do good vascular surgery and go forward. And I have uh, family nearby. I want, to, I want to stay in this particular area of the country. Then I think that's fine. And that may be it. I always wanted to kind of get more involved, get more involved in education uh, and, and to kind of developing new technology, uh, involved in my regional society, which fortunately I was able to do here in, in New York with the Eastern. Um, but, you know, I think it is something where you really have to kind of say, is this where I, is this what I want to do for the rest of my life? And for me at, you know, probably five to seven years uh, to your point, um, that was probably when I really should have started looking more. I was comfortable. Everything was okay. I had a great practice, but I wasn't really thinking that I'm doing everything I want to do. Uh, and it was lucky that I happened to meet uh, Dr. Kent at um, a program director's meetings, but I probably should have been a little bit more proactive looking sooner to try and make that move because I felt like the last kind of three years of my first part of my, uh, my first job weren't appropriate, were kind of wasted time to some extent because I kept doing the same thing over and over again. So I, I think it is important you have to decide what's right for me. Do I, this is, is this what I want or do I want to do more? And if you're not going to be able to get it where you are, you need to start looking. Uh, I kind of use a basic uh, rule of thumb is that if I'm just going to look at jobs, the first one's a freebie. Most chairs agree with this mentality. You don't have to go tell your chief. You don't have to go ch tell your chair that you're out interviewing. Everyone knows people are looking. A lot of it's done just by simple conversation, like we were having last week at Veith and everything else, um, where you just kind of find out what's out there, who's available, and it may just be a simple sidebar conversation. The second interview is where it's getting a little bit more serious. Uh, and it depends on your relationship with your, your chief and, and where you're looking to go. If you're looking to go to one of the competitors, you probably should let them know sooner rather than later. You never want them blindsided. If you're moving from Chicago to New York, um, I actually did that recruitment twice. The first time we went all the way through the three interviews, had the job offer. And my wife and I, they said, go out and see a Broadway show while you're here in New York. And we went out and saw Chicago. So told us we really weren't quite ready to, to come to leave Chicago at that time. Uh, but then later it got to the point, yes, it's time to go. 
Um, but I did go back and tell my chair at the, after the second interview that, yes, we're talking. And he said, well, I, I kind of gathered your heart was still back there. And, and he was very supportive of me, me moving forward. He didn't want you know, me to leave, but certainly he knew that that was the right thing for me. So first one's a freebie. Go talk. See what's out there. Second one, if it really goes well and you think you want to proceed, then I'd let my, my, my division chief or my chair uh, know what's going on. Then generally you have a third interview where they actually go into salary location, looking at housing looking and that type of thing. Exactly. But the first one's really where, and I encourage people to go out and just see what's out there. It may just make you realize, hey, I've got it pretty good where I am. Uh, or you may get some ideas. I may stay here, but I want to focus more on this aspect or that aspect, developing an OBL, developing a vein practice, developing a thoracoabdominal practice. These are all things that you can do. In the meantime, when you go out and visit these other institutions, you get more ideas of what's going to make you happy. But first one's a freebie. Second one, if it goes well and you really want to continue, need to let your your, your uh, chair and, and, and chief know. Uh, and then the third one is generally when things get done. And it can be fortuitous. I mean, I always thought at the end of my career, I'd be back in Africa where I was raised. And that's, you know, where I wanted to be a, a physician and a surgeon as a kid. Um, and that exposure was on a farm. And I thought towards the end of my life, I will be volunteering or doing some work in Africa. And of course, it's not going to happen as a vascular surgeon, maybe as a general surgeon. Mm -hmm. And where I am now, I'm, I'm serving the underserved. And it, it, it is as you know as good as i would ever want it to be and so i've been very fortunate in that sense that i'm i'm able to do the things that i want at this part of my career um and get the the rewards that i want from the work that i'm doing in in more than just the you know a paycheck and a, a status at, at at some institution that it's really rewarding so you really have to figure out what it is that turns you on or what gets you up in the morning and and seek it. Don't wait for it to come to you. Well, we. Um, uh, oh, go ahead. I, Sorry. Yeah, I, I was just going to bring up the whole financial thing. Um, many people, especially in mid-career, and you know, we were having, you know, we had four kids, and you know, all that. You know, obviously, you have a lot of financial responsibility. But I think it's important also as you're kind of coming through is that you know, as I'm looking back after over a 28-year career. Um, it's like, boy, do I remember doing that one other fem pop where I probably could have just given my partner and made it to my kid's game or got additional paper out or whatever the case may be. Um, and so don't chase the almighty dollar uh, at the expense of your family or at the expense of thing, doing focusing more on things that you really want to do. Um, and for me, I, I've been um, somewhat, you know, I don't do EVLTs. I don't do vein. Um, and I've, I've talked to some of my junior partners and say, hey, why don't you come do these thoraco abdominals with me? And they're like, well, I can do two EVLTs and financially make more than I can doing a uh, complex thoraco abdominal as a co-surgeon. And they're right. You can. But it really depends on what's important to you. So, uh, you know, everyone's going to make a great living. It's not going to be that you're going to be worried about how you're going to make your mortgage payments uh, unless you go out and, you know, buy some palatial house and that $250,000 car. Um, but, you know, if you come out and you're reasonable with everything, you can have a great practice, you can have a great life, and don't chase the almighty dollar. Um, well, we already have a, a live question, um, so I'll go ahead and read it. Um, hi, I'm a fellow in the Mid-Atlantic region. This webcast has been amazing. Thank you. Three questions. What are some things you did or wish you did early in your attending career that helped you in the long run? What were some things that your peers did that you might consider if you could redo it? And lastly, what are things in that you look for in a position now that you may have overlooked or not considered? considered when you were a fellow or junior faculty? Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Gemma. You take one, then I'll take the next. Okay. All right. Um, I think the thing is I look back um, and, you know, the, it's the little things, you know, trying to make sure I, I wrote more um, uh, sooner because I really didn't do that much uh, uh, writing of papers when I when I could have earlier on. I was too busy chasing cases and trying to set up. You know, I tried to do a basic science lab, but every time I had, you know, a critical assay or an in situ hybridization coming in, that I needed to make an endpoint. 
Um, somebody came in with a cold leg and I went and took care of that. So I should have quick, more quickly realized that wasn't the, the path for me. Um, but, you know, I think coming in and trying to not do as many cases uh, and try and uh, be more attuned to the area I wanted to focus on. Uh, and then also making sure that uh, I was writing uh, on, in the area that was uh, important to me. Uh, certainly you need to have a, a, a kind of a diversity in your publication, but you should become known for something. Uh, and, you know, sometimes you have to change. Like I say, I was the aneurysm and Prada guy, then became the, the critical and ischemia person. And I was out really being the Bush in publishing and got to be a national PI and one of the trials for that and everything else. But then I came back and started doing more with aortic work again. So you just have to say what in this 10 year block of your career, what you're going to focus on and really say, this is me critical for me and really try and, and draw the attention to that. Uh, stay on top of things. Don't procrastinate. Uh, I think that's something that we all kind of, oh, yeah, I'll take care of that tomorrow. I'll, I'll go to my kids' baseball game next week and not this week. You know, those, you know, those are the things I look back and say, I wish I would have done. I did a lot of them, but I didn't do all of them. And so it was kind of, I wish I would have done a little bit more of that as I look back. Um, for people, again, I say, you know, always, you know, you need to do an inventory of what's important to you. And then refresh that. I encourage people to come out, especially in the fellow level, say, where do I want to be in five years? And then why? And what am I going to do to get that? Because there'll be a lot of diversions along the way as you go out. And if you don't keep some type of internal focus, find a mentor and be honest with that mentor. Um, and say, you know, this is what's really important to me. And, you know, if you say it's really important for me to become president of the Eastern Basker, or it's really important to me to, to become a chairman, or it's really important to me to make a lot of money. These are things you need to, to be able to verbalize to someone that you trust and have them help say, well, if that's what you want, that's fine, because none of those are the wrong answer. But just what's important to you and then how you help get it. And then, then you need to go back and look at that list, that inventory uh, at you know two and a half years and say, OK, am I following the right path or not? And then maybe go back and talk to a mentor or even a mentor outside your institution to say, am I really following in the right way? So if you say, I want to be a Palma Shaw in, in 15 years. How do you do that? And then that's something you may have to ask Palma Shaw. I, I would agree with you. So the first question is, what do you wish you had done earlier? Well, I remember in general surgery residency, seeing my colleagues all winning awards. I'm like, why are they winning awards? Why am I not winning awards? Well, guess what? I'd never applied for one. <laughs> so if you never apply, you're not going to get anything. If, you know, so, you know, and, and so along that line, find what interests you first. And, and I would say my pathway was surgical education. And I applied for the Wiley traveling fellowship and I got it. And that provided opportunities for me to meet some people around the world that were surgical masters in education. And one of the physicians that I met was Richard Resnick. And when I asked for his advice and I asked everyone for their advice, he said, if you want to be a leader or an expert in this area, you need to get the background and, and the skill set that makes you an ex expert. So that drove me to get a master's in surgical education. And of course I had to do it in London because the shopping is lovely in London <laughs> and life is lovely in London. So I gained my surgical education career in London. And that that experience led to another thing that you know my master's dissertation became every single paper that I had to write for that master's program became a paper that I published. So there wasn't duplicate work. I whatever I did, I made sure it counted twice or three times. And then that became the work for the for vital and that became the work for the milestones and the v-score so build on something and sort of go up versus wide so you know build you know do a systematic review of whatever it is you're interested in and that will make you the expert because you will know every single paper out there you know who wrote them who the experts are and you know what hasn't been studied and what has been studied and i think that will help you, you know, become an expert in whatever it is that you want to do so that's one thing, apply for things and, and then work sort of up versus out. Um, the next thing was I wish I had focused more on physician relationships when I was in academia. I learned that skill set when I was in private practice for a couple of years because we always left it to the residents and the fellows. And I now that I'm back in academia, I make sure I have those relationships with the attending staff as well as my residents and fellows. I kind of missed that part somewhere along the way. 
when I was a faculty member, and I think I missed out on quite a bit. I, I missed out on sort of developing strong relationships with all the physicians in the hospital. So that's a, a take home, you know, strive to build a rich network in the hospital that you work in. And then thirdly, what was that final question? Uh, the, what are things in that you look for in a position now that you so, may have overlooked or not considered when you were fellow or junior faculty? Yes, find someone who will let you blossom. You want someone that will let you be who you are and will provide you opportunities, not only as a mentor, but as a sponsor, but not only that, but kind of like a proud mom. You know, your success is my success. So find someone who really wants to see you grow. And not every job will provide you that opportunity. So when you are looking for a new position, whether it's academia or private practice, you spend more time with your partners than you do with your partner at home, sadly, some days. And so make sure that you really like the people you work with. I think, you know, at the end of the day, then you don't mind being at work later if you have to be at work later. I, I've kind of gone one step further with that being again more senior in my career um, is the next position I go to and what made me change to Sinai was the opportunity to help facilitate the younger faculty learning new technology and new techniques. Uh, and that's really, I'm not going to go, I wouldn't consider going anywhere if it's just for me to bang out more cases and do complicated cases. Uh, it's what I did here. And uh, I'm working with one of my, my faculty that, you know, five years ago I mentored him and now he's doing it. And I'm just here giving him a hand and I'm doing a fairly, you know, can be case, not bad, but certainly it's an interesting and new challenging case. So I think for me, I'm looking to take the, the skills that I've learned over the last 28 years and help give it to the next generation and help mentor them. I don't really need to be doing the cases. I don't need any of the other accolades, kind of whatever it's been, it's been. Now I'm just looking how to, to give back and help other people move forward because they're going to be the, the future for all of us. This has Absolutely. been great. This is just so much excellent information. I'm so glad it's taped because so many people are going to go back and watch all of this wisdom that uh, you both have imparted upon us. I want to ask a question about innovation. I mean, I think, Erica, it seems like your innovation has been in education. And Jim, you have a patent. And I would love to hear a little bit about how, because uh, in my MBA class, we had a whole class on patents. And uh, it's not that easy to pull that off. So I'd love to hear each of your, you know, attempted innovation. Erica, I think it's your turn to go first. Sure. So I... As I alluded to earlier, my focus has been surgical education, albeit now I'm sort of going towards trauma. But I think, you know, I'm, I think the work that I'm most proud of when I call innovative, it's not a patent, but it's it's a decision making in vascular surgery book. And and the book is not a chapter in the sense of you read the whole chapter and then you still don't know what to do. This book is an algorithmic approach, decision making tree on what to do when you are faced with a problem. And I think that to me has been innovative. It's allowed me to bring my engineering skills together with my medical skills and sort of look at things, approach things systematically. So that's sort of my innovative thing. And right now I'm learning a lot about trauma and I'm certainly hoping to apply some new AI to trauma, but that, and I'll tell you about that 10 years from now. <laughs> I think the AI stuff coming out for aneurysm and everything else is just amazing. Uh, we had several presentations at the Eastern this year, and, and I'm just floored. We're going to learn more. We're now looking at getting AI to look for undiagnosed dissections and all our patients coming in with chest CTs. Uh, they have it already ongoing for intracranial bleeds and uh, large vessel occlusion intracranially for people coming in with stroke, and it's all done AI. So, I mean, I think that's going to be amazing and change how we look at everything. Um, you know, I think for innovation, how you get patents, well, you just have to be observant. You can't just accept the status quo uh, and say, okay, well, how could I do this? Is there another way of doing it? And, you know, I was, my patent is looking at variable weave and, and do, using scent localization to try and do branch graphs. Um, no one had done it, but you have to search. And many times you come with all these great ideas and you Google them and realize that someone already thought of it and had already patented it and everything else. Um, but, you know, it, it's just constantly questioning everything. Don't accept the status quo. 
whether it be a technique, whether it be a device, um, uh, just procedurally how you do things. And, and I agree, same thing we did with how we changed the whole medical student program uh, for the uh, uh, American College of Surgeons. ASE is a great place to start for education. And I think that was something that was really instrumental in my path of finding people that were very good, Richard included, that just really uh, said, you know, you could see how well this could be done. Um, so you see what's been done. You think what else needs to be done. You're observant. Uh, you don't just accept things as they are and say, well, what we do differently. And then you, you come up with an idea and then you see if it's there and you find a partner or whatever. I found an industrial partner because uh, I didn't have the ability to get, you know, different weaves and everything else and had to have someone manufacture my localizing stents. Uh, so you kind of sign off some of those with them as co-people uh, uh, on the patent, but still it's your idea. Uh, and so it's just having that questioning in mind as you go through all this and, and uh, say, well, what else could be new out there and innovative? And next thing you know, you're a patent and you're up on the podium talking about it. Did you find any uh, venture capitalist support for that or how far did you take that? Um, we, actually, I went to one of the major industry people and, and had them uh, kind of help. And they, were, they had the, the pockets and the materials that let us do it. Um, but then you sign a lot of that over to them also. Uh, I think you're certainly seeing a lot more people coming in now um, with the idea of uh, getting their own fundraising and then, then getting up to a prototype and then, then they can try and sell it off to industry. And it's a lot more lucrative. Earlier on, people were just patenting concepts. I mean, you think about, you know, people coming in patenting modularity for endovascular or extent graphs. So someone saw Perotti's initial presentation and that was a, a tube graft. And they said, well, one way to do this is with modularity. And so they patented the concept of modularity. And I think Tom Fogarty's done fairly well with that. And uh, actually, I think it was, um, oh, Jeff uh, White from Australia was when I had the main patent on that. Um, but yeah, I, I think there's just coming up with concepts. And you look at Fogarty for the Fogarty balloon. He just saw the need because he saw all these patients coming in with, with thrombosis. And he took a, a, a catheter and cut a finger off a glove secured it, and that was the first Fogarty embolectomy catheter. So you saw a need, you then created a prototype and went from there. Great advice. Um, so how did um, your change in career and location affect um, your family and your, and your loved ones? And any advice on how to adapt to that? Well, my husband's not very happy we're in Memphis because there's no fly fishing here. However, he's a, he's a, he's a, a Justin Nicey. I mean, he, he, he just has to get on a plane to go fly for somewhere or we'll go to Arkansas. Um, it is hard. I mean, you have to consider it's, a, it's your team. I mean, you know, the way John and I look at our moves and our and my career changes in the last couple of years has more been like, I could not do it without him. And he's sort of been the, like the Zen in the family and I'm a little bit here and there, but but at the same time, it's providing a richness for him too, um, an opportunity. But it, it it's not that easy. I mean, when you look at late major life stressors, marriage, divorce, a move, a new job, new city, so it's it's not easy. But I think if you sort of are committed together, then it's easier than if you're sort of dragging your spouse or partner kicking and, and screaming or you know, trying to live apart in two different states. I think that would would be harder for me than, um, you know, one of us struggling a little bit to begin with. I don't know. That's what do you awesome. say, Jim? Yeah, I, I think it's being very honest with your partner uh, and it's kind of setting up the expectations. Um, you know, we, again, I married 31 years ago. Uh, I'm still married. Uh, and, you know, it was we discussed where we're going, where our life's goal were, children, the whole nine yards. Uh, like I say, we moved when she, we had a six month old and she had a very good job she loved uh, to Chicago where we knew no one and her parents were there in, in Atlanta. So that was a big move and she took a leap of faith and that was something I, I've always you know appreciated and loved her for. Um, but then when we got there, you know, again, you were open, observant. I happen to, my wife's a critical care flight nurse. So she does, did trauma and critical care transport and helicopters and fixed wing. Kind of a niche type of job. Well, happened to go in there and my first weekend on call was 4th of July weekend. And the, the flight uh, program director was actually picking up a shift because everyone else wanted off for the 4th of July. 
and we had a symptomatic aneurysm flown in. So he flew it in. Next thing you know, I'm talking to him. I didn't say, okay, here, let's we go through that. I started finding out a little bit, found out. I said, well, you know, my wife's a flight nurse. She's, oh, really? We're looking for one. So next thing I know, she's flying for UCAN, which is one of the premier programs for flight nurses in the country. Uh, so it just happened to work out. Um, then as she, we had second, third, and fourth child, she cut her hours back, cut her hours back more. And like I said, we had offers to go back to Atlanta. We had offers to go to the Midwest. Um, we had offered in Omaha, which she couldn't even say the word Omaha, unfortunately. So that, that one didn't work out. So I'd say, all right, that's off the table. Um, and then we, it was very much a joint decision. We said, do we want to go to New York? And she's like, you know, I've made my life in Chicago. I'm happy. I made friends. Um, and if it's not right for us to go back to the Southeast yet, then we won't do it. And we came to New York. Now, um, we did just, uh, have it we have a, a summer place now in northern north carolina with excellent fly fishing so if you and your husband want to come visit us in northern uh, western north carolina you're welcome to come out and bring it because i'm my wife just gave me a fly rod for my birthday because i said i wanted to learn so bring your husband on down to, to bryson city north carolina and we'll, we'll hook him up so um but yeah it's just talking and then really working with them and managing expectations, being honest with them. Don't think that you're going to sneak something past them because it never works and just say, you know, listen to them and see what they want and what their needs are. And have someone that's very understanding. Well, that's great. I mean, it sounds like they're kind of your rock throughout all the different changes. Um, very, very much so. Yeah. yeah, I mean, she's my best friend, and certainly whenever I have the hard decision, she's the first one I go to. Or a bad day, she's the first one I go to. Thirty-seven. And did you have to move your your children? Were they in school or when you? No, no. Did, oh yeah. Did them, oh. <laughs> Hey, well, the first the first move to Chicago, he, the, we only had one. He was six months old, so he was pretty much yeah. he, he went wherever we went, and left him there. But when we moved to Chicago, we had four uh, from going just into high school all the way down to preschool, um, and there was a lot of discussion. Uh, and we actually went over and kind of looked at the schools, and and we flew them all in and had them go around and see and see kind of the area we're thinking of moving to and everything else. But um, it was very tough moving mm -hmm. all of them. But they made new friends and they did great. Yeah. And it's funny because I always thought of our Chicago place where three of the four were born and really grew up to a greater extent as where they're considered home. But no, they consider New York as their home. Really? And that's, that's okay. where they, they kind of equate back. And when, you know, I had, when I made the move from Columbia to Sinai, I was certainly considering going other places too, wanting to get that next move to become more of one that gave back to the faculty than one that was just running the division. Um, but I had two kids that were still in high school. Uh, and I'm like, I'm not moving. So we made it, my wife and I discussed, we made the conscious decision that I would stay here in New York one way or another, just so they could get through high school. Um, now they've all graduated and all, all finished you know, undergrad and everything else now. So now we're free to kind of look and see what else we're gonna do. But um, for that time when it was really making that move, uh, back in 2014, it, it, we decided we had to stay in New York. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, yeah. Sinai gave me a great job, so I was very pleased with that. Got lucky again. Yeah. Well, because high school is a tough time, no, no matter if you're moving yeah. or not. So. Right. And, and again, unfortunately, I kind of learned that the hard way. My father passed away when I was 15. And so my mother tried to do everything we could and we got into just my end of my junior year and she ended up remarrying and saying well go ahead and you know get active because i was in a bunch of clubs and band and everything else uh and sure enough right after um i got elected to a couple of the offices um she sold the house and what i ended up doing was spending my first half of my senior year living with friends and then commuting two hours on the weekends to work and, and visit with my family so sometimes you have to get creative but there's our ways of doing it, but I wasn't gonna move all, especially with two kids in high school, I wasn't gonna move them at that yeah. point in time. Ted, a question, I, I know Erica, you more recently changed positions and Jim, you've changed. When you first land in that new job, you're not really sure who your, who your allies are, right? You have to scope it out. Sometimes people that seem like they're your friends or very eager to befriend you are really not that eager to support you. It's just, you know, how do you, uh, how do you really form that team, that team that has allowed you to become successful in this endeavor? 
I was, okay. yeah, I was very fortunate in the sense that when I moved to Memphis, the new hire for for the Department of uh, Surgery Trauma was also a new hire. So the new incoming division chief for trauma was came in a month before me, and we communicated and connected before we both came out there and kind of developed an allyship before we even came out. So when he onboarded, he sort of helped me onboard, and we just became very good friends because we were both wanting to take the program in the same direction. And I think that was important. We, we both want to be in the same direction. So that way we have someone to bounce things off. But it is hard, and I would say, especially as you're more senior, um, I'm the most senior person in, in vascular surgery. I, I do miss the ability to sort of bounce things off partners, but unfortunately I have my vascular besties and you know we'll text or send pictures and you know so I do have support in that way. But it is important that you do have some allyship and and but I think if you work hard and you have good outcomes and you provide good service, you'll win over the hearts and minds of people. You know, so that's you know, when you're showing them you're doing a good job, I, you know, you don't really have to worry about it as long as you're not fighting the institution in the direction that you want to go. So you, you've got to make sure that you're aligned with where you want to take the program with the institutional goals before you even sign up for the job. <laughs> you don't want that to be a surprise once you get there. I think that's a really critical point is you, you get to know the people before you actually make the move to a greater extent. Um, you know, I've seen people have gone through and they never got to meet the faculty when they were being recruited to, to go to the position as a chief. Well, I think that's just, uh, you know, a recipe for disaster. Come in with, with expectations. You know, like I say, when I, when I went to Columbia, the first thing I said is, I'm not here to take your practice. I'm helped to build your practice. And we actually set, started taking, setting up all the training programs I started in Chicago here, which had never been done in New York because everyone said, all you're doing is training the competition. I said, no, I'm training the referral basis. And so you help them, you facilitate them, and then they'll turn around and, and give you complicated cases and, and you kind of build on that and you work back and forth. Uh, but the you know three A's are always, you know, it's true when you're building a practice or you're working with partners or whatever. Uh, and you really just have to, to trust but verify. And so, you know, I'll trust you until you prove I should. Uh, and, you know, I've been really successful. And you give back time, you give back energy. You come back and say, hey, you know, can you do this FEMPOP for me? Or can you, you go out and introduce them to the you know, potential referral base? So the more you help facilitate them, the more they're going to see that you're there to help them and not to take away from them. Because many times I've seen, you know, chiefs or new, more senior partners join a practice. The first thing they want to do is take from every way within the practice. Well, that doesn't build trust. That doesn't help anything. Uh, and again, the more you build and, and more you collaborate, the more you're honest with people and tell them what your goals are uh, and see where you can find people that have similar goals and then explore it. And hey, let's go have a talk. Let's go have a beer and kind of discuss it and then make sure you follow up on all that. But the thing about it is you can't assume that people are going to do something. Uh, always that quick little email now. I mean, communication now is so much easier where it's not trying to call someone, send them a letter or whatever. Just shoot them an email, shoot them a text. Just thinking about this, you know, here's where we are with my thoughts. What are your thoughts? The more you can communicate and get people engaged, say that you're, you're you know, do what you say you're going to do uh, and then listen to what they want to do. And, and unlike what I'm doing right now, I think the biggest thing you can do is ask few questions and listen much more than than you speak, because you can really find out what they're wanting and, and then see how you can work well together. I agree with you, Jim, on doing what you say you're going to do. Don't make empty promises and don't promise what you can't deliver. Right. Very important. So um, if you, uh, we have a few minutes left of the um, webcast. So what one piece of advice would you give to your younger self? Don't sweat small stuff and take care of your health. I think Eric and I both have had uh, life-threatening or challenges also. Uh, Erica shared cancer. I had an acute LED occlusion, which was kind of uh, awakening. Um, and so you realize life's not a dress rehearsal. You've got to try and make sure you're, you're focusing on things that's important to your practice, your people that you work with, and your family. So, so if anything, I, I would have tried to make sure I was a little bit more focused, more out there, and, and kind of listening to it more than, than speaking. Palmer. It's not about you. Yeah. 
Well, you know, it's funny. We, we talk about health because we just did our um, resident yoga session last Friday for the first time. And some people are more flexible than others. But <laughs> um, Palma, any last comments before we wrap up? No, I just think this is really valuable information. I, I identify with uh, a lot of the points that have been made in, in my career. And, um, and I think you both are ahead of me as far as um, knowing how to analyze these things. So I really appreciate your insight. I really do and have great admiration for both of you. And I sincerely, sincerely appreciate your taking the time to speak to us and to speak to everybody that's listening because I'm sure they've learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and next month. Well, thank you for having us on. Yes, thank you. Oh, and uh, next month, we're going to talk about pregnancy challenges for the female surgeons, the data behind real world experience. So stay tuned. Thanks. Hello, I'm Dr. William Zogby, Chair of the Department of Cardiology here at Houston Methodist DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center. I invite you to join us for our 11th annual Multimodality Cardiovascular Imaging for the Clinician. As you know, cardiovascular imaging plays a vital role in the management of the cardiovascular patient. Knowledge of various imaging modalities is critical to understanding their advantages, limitations, and appropriate use in patients with coronary disease, heart failure, and valvular heart disease. We will highlight the latest advantages and applications of all imaging modalities, including echocardiography, nuclear and PET, CT and cardiac MRI. In addition to didactic lectures by world experts, this conference offers the opportunity to participate in small group tutorials in each imaging modality. Demonstrations of heart anatomy also will help relate imaging to cardiac and valvular conditions. This two and a half day symposium offers small group read with the experts sessions and allows you to learn interactively using case studies in each imaging modality. Also earn CME credits in this course designed for physicians, mid-levels, nurses and trainees specializing in cardiovascular care. We also encourage sonographers and imaging technologists in areas such as echocardiography, nuclear cardiology and PET, cardiac CT and MRI to attend. Learn more about this year's exciting agenda by visiting our website. We look forward to seeing you in December.